calls them that. The Legion of the Legion. Nobody calls them that. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah, I'm like pretty sure. I've been to bars and stuff. Are there? Is that like a, a local Norwegian no, Legion I, bar? I've been to bars in Pennsylvania. We were at that bar that one time. Oh, I don't and think you were the only black dude, and we walked in, and everyone just like stopped. You took me to an Irish pub. It was the only place off the highway. Why are Irish pubs and sports bars the only bars that exist? Because white people. It's well, called culture. Elliot. I guess there's this new thing called the like, gastro pubs, where it's a place where you can go and get a beer that's twenty five dollars, and it doesn't taste very good, but because it's twenty five dollars, you just convince yourself it's a delicious beer. There's a lot of bicycles out front and short pants. Yep. Hey, Pat, folks. Patchy facial hair. <laughs> Welcome back. This is Andy with the Poor Proles Almanac, here with our 27th or 28th episode. I'm not sure, actually. And you can find us wherever you're listening to podcasts right now, as well as probably the alley of your local Norwegian bar, as Elliot can attest. And, of course, you can find us on Patreon if you're enjoying what we're doing here and you would like to help cover the costs of hosting the podcast. We're also going to be starting up a Venmo and a PayPal. So if you just enjoyed this episode, you don't want to commit to a monthly donation, you just want to throw a couple bucks because you learned something new and you thought it was fun and enjoyable, uh, we'll give you that option too. In terms of the Patreon, we don't explicitly offer any of our traditional content focused on the specific goals of this podcast to our Patreons in terms of limited access or anything like that right now. Knowledge is for everyone. I know you love that. But we have started up a Patreon-only miniseries called The Prologues, during which we will do some critiques on various subject matters and kind of talk about some different historical stuff that ties into what we're generally interested in on this podcast. If you're interested, here's a quick clip of what's over on the Patreon-only section. Basically, his observation led to the emergence of the fruit wall, which is what we kind of glossed over at the beginning. But that's what brought it to northern France, England, Belgium, and the Netherlands was uh, his experiment or his observation of his experiments in 1561. I just wanted to get that point in there just because it was a name drop. And I feel like you got to give credit where credit's due. If people are going to hear their shit and hear Paul Pearl's Almanac and the prologues and stuff, I hope they drop. My name, my name's Elliot, and say, like, he did it, rather than just gloss over it and be like, that shit never really existed, it wasn't important. If you're interested and you're willing to donate $2, it's up on our Patreon. There's also a bunch of other episodes. Right now, there's just around 20, so the content's growing pretty quickly. We've also released one of those episodes that was asked for by popular demand for public consumption, generally about guns for people that didn't grow up around guns. So if you're curious, that's a good place to go check it out and see if you want to hear more. On top of this content, we've got stickers available, and we're starting to include some footage from my farm, putting the theory we're talking about into practice. So if you want to see what's going on over there, check out the Patreon. While we do enjoy making this content, there's about 20 hours worth of work that goes into each episode. So any support we can get to offset our actual costs, we fully and wholeheartedly appreciate. So again, go check us out on Patreon. We're also on Instagram and Facebook if you want to follow us over there. And if this is your first episode, we highly recommend going back to the first episode of the podcast. You don't necessarily have to catch up, but it gives you a good framework for what we're thinking about as we attack these different subject areas. Yeah, we repeat ourselves a lot because it's hard coming up with content. <laughs> <laughs> I got him to agree with that. It's uh, not that hard, dude. It's fucking easy as shit. I love doing it. Uh, if you don't want to listen to the entire catalog at this point, I do at least recommend going to the beginning of this mini series where we talk about permaculture and kind of these ideas of indigenous farming. Recently, we talked about Havana as well as Detroit and some of the urban projects going on over there. And in this episode, we're going in a little bit of a different direction. Our goal with this mini series is to really challenge one of the largest questions that I think comes up very commonly when we start talking about these different farming practices that don't rely on massive petrochemical energy. And that's the question of how do we detangle colonization from agriculture when permaculture, for example, has such a problematic past and in many ways present. We recently did that dive into permaculture in a recent episode, chronicling its history, what permaculturalists believe, some of the problems associated with the practice and the movement. With that framed up, 
the series is all about ancient farming practices and re-indigenizing our understanding of where farming came from. Today, we're talking about some indigenous farming practices in Norway. While folks don't normally think of Norway as having indigenous people or thinking of their farming practices as being in any way outside of the scope of what whiteness is or however you want to think about that conversation, the reality is that they have a very unique farming history that up until recently had existed outside of the scope of what you might call traditional agriculture, what we think of as agriculture. And it, it's really important to have this conversation because it opens up that conversation of what is whiteness and how can we deconstruct that whiteness into finding real, authentic communities and identities. I have no idea what whiteness is. I mean, you're white challenged. I'm, you, you seem to be lacking a lot of whiteness. I play hockey. <laughs> I mean, except for that. You live in Boston. You have to play at least like some white sport. Yeah, well, that's just to make it to the winter without like crippling depression. You have to have something to look forward to. <laughs> like seriously, that's why I started skiing, snowboarding, all that bullshit. It's literally to have something to look forward to during the winter because without it, it's just six months of fucking cold, misery, just cold, yeah. miserable hell. Yeah, I mean, I I'm a big soccer guy, and then winter rolls around. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna get into hockey this year, and then I'm just too fucking miserable to even like try. I lucked out. I learned to skate. Before I learned to skate in Texas, actually, before I moved up here. Really? Yeah. That's cool. There was a ice rink in the Galleria Mall in Houston. I'm sure they I, weren't going bankrupt trying to keep an ice rink cold in Texas. No, man. Dude, they had uh, good energy efficiency in Texas. The HVAC was on point back in the day. And they, it was like, you know, one of the buildings that had turnstile doors and all that stuff yeah. to keep AC in and like all the hot weather out. So that's cool. But anyway, back to the topic at hand. Okay, so, after extensive research, we found out that Norway is kind of cold. It's kind of a cold place. Surprise. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. Uh, because of this, in Norwegian traditional agriculture, every bit of the landscape was used, and this intensive agricultural use may have been at its peak around 1900. The mountainous landscape, the short summer season, and the isolating lifestyle of the country itself, which is more sparse than others by most standards, has led to some unique conditions for the local populations. It seems very likely that what evolved in Western Norway harmonized the gatherer economy with the beginning of the agricultural way of life. In this landscape, both continued well into the 20th century of our era. Many of these peasants, however, were fishermen, as well as being farmers. This is especially true of the North, where they were able to continue their old-fashioned methods of farming aimed simply at subsistence. And this type of farming combined with fishing, which sometimes kept the men away for weeks or months at a time, contributed to give the peasant community in the fishing districts characteristics which persisted right up to our times today. Yeah, so the first thing I think that's wild is that some of those farming practices were still being done like 120 years ago. So it hasn't been gone for long, but it seems like a lot has been lost. I mean, I know when we started talking about doing this episode, I was kind of familiar with this process of what they were doing. And we started trying to do some research. And if you Google historical Norwegian farming practices, you're not going to find anything. So a lot of what we did for this episode came primarily from actual research papers and things like that. So if you are interested, that's where you're going to have to go. Or you can just listen to this on loop and live your best Norwegian dream. Oh, man. I'll, did you ever watch Metalocalypse, bro? Yes. All right. So all I, all I can think about is Toki right now. Yes. His parents, his dad <laughs> did that episode. Yes. If you haven't seen it, dude, watch Metalocalypse. So funny. But all I can think about is parents and how they just stare at <laughs> stare at <him laughs> all, all religious-like and stuff. And it's so creepy. That, that's all I think about the Weegians. The, the Norwegians. The Norwegians. All the Norwegians I know are swimmers, so I don't know. I don't know what that means. They got long arms, I think. Yeah, I guess. They got long, they're, they're just long people. They are long They people. got long boats, yeah. long arms, big shoulders, for sure. This is starting to get into, like, racist territory. No, I'm literally just describing, my, <laughs> describing one of my best friends. Dude. Talking about Corey? <laughs> no, John, dude. Oh, yeah, I guess him, too. Big shoulders, long arms. 
So yeah, I think what was really interesting in terms of this concept of their agricultural system is the integration of hunter-gathering with their food systems uh, being agriculturally based, where they were sustainably harvesting as well as growing foods and utilizing and maximizing microclimates as well as the short growing seasons by doing things. Essentially what they would do is they would have a house with a immediate uh, garden area and then they would have like their orchard type area and then they would have the the wood a uh, managed woods that was uh, grazable and we'll talk about this in a little bit but what they would do is essentially create these micro zones that they would use that this was their summer house this was their winter house and sometimes they had multiple houses because they had to graze so extensively to meet the caloric needs of their their uh, grazers the things that they were grazing around their properties. Right, because they strictly couldn't grow or farm all of the food. This is subsistence farming. Yeah. I think having this conversation, I think that's the one thing that really stood out to me about this is the difference between farming all of your food and farming to supplement other food. And this approach seems very balanced to me, and I think that's why it lasted as long as it did. And that's like part of why their diet is what it is. Like when you talk about Norwegian food or Scandinavian food in general, it's very meat heavy Mm -hmm. because there wasn't a lot of things that could survive those long winters and store for those long winters to eat outside of meat. Right. You wouldn't imagine with a short growing season and a short season of harvest that you'd have a whole lot of fresh vegetables or fruits. You're going to assume that, you know, I would assume everything's going to be heavily salted or pickled in order to survive through those months where things aren't going to be fresh, you don't have that available. Yeah, and that's why they also were usually located near the ocean. It gave them access to not only fish and kelp and all those other things that they could utilize, but also the salt itself. Mm -hmm. But the thing I think that gets forgotten about animals and agriculture is that they are able to convert things that we can't eat into something we can eat. So if we have grass, or as we'll talk about, leaves and things like that that we can't eat we can feed it to an animal that can eat it and then eat that animal so we're able to utilize an environment that isn't necessarily designed for human consumption that just brought using, up, they're, cows are middlemen or sheep in this case sheep and goats are like middlemen they are but i just the, when you said that the first thing that i thought of was piggy bank and like usually you think about like putting money in that like to save it but like thinking about the caloric needs that you have versus meeting the caloric needs of, you know, whatever animal you're rearing. That's the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's the yeah. same thing. You're, you're, Animals you're, are quite literally piggy banks. Right. That's what yeah. I'm saying. It's it's putting that, a pig back in piggy bank. I guess. Uh, what I thought really was unique and I kind of want to talk about more because it's a personal research area of mine that again, much like this episode, there is not a lot out there on it. And a lot of this knowledge has been Uh, extensively lost, which is frightening in a lot of ways, was that a lot of these animals that the they kept on their farms weren't just fed hay, like traditional hay, like we think of, but what's called tree hay, which is quite literally cutting small branches from trees and feeding them the leaves and the, the bark and the insides of the small branches that are very tender. And this is what the animals would live on during the winter, which is wild, because it's like one of those things that you hear, you hear it and you're like, oh, That makes a lot of sense, but it's not a practice that's, it's been completely forgotten for most, like it's one of those things that it's so forgotten that a lot of extension schools that do agriculture have wrong information about it. Like a lot of them will say black locust is poisonous and every single person I know that uses black locust to feed their animals is like, it's not poisonous. It's poisonous to people. People can't eat it, but Well, yeah, but I mean like the, the extension schools will be like, you can't feed this to sheep or goats and. People are like, they love it. I feed them it every day. Right. And so that speaks to the fact that so much, even the basic understanding of this knowledge, so much of it has been lost and we're still relearning it. This was only 120 years ago Mm -hmm. and most people don't know it. There's no, if you try to go on Amazon and buy a book about tree hay, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It speaks to the fact that if you can't find it on Amazon, it doesn't exist. Yeah. So I guess this would be lost knowledge at this point. But you have to take a look at it because at the beginning of the episode, we were talking about how this particular population that we're looking at is a culmination between uh, gatherers and the beginning of agriculture. So if you understand that the history of that's how this all started, 
doesn't it make sense that they wouldn't be growing fields or um, well, yeah. mowing fields particularly to feed their animals, but they're just using what's around they, to feed them, they but did using a, it to sta- doing it sustainably? They did a, a bit of both. So they did have hay fields, and I'll cover that in a minute. Because they had such a long winter, it wasn't practical to be able to have enough field to harvest enough hay mm-hmm. for the winter. So they would have tree hay and traditional hay. Um, the benefit of the leaf fodder is that it requires less sophisticated tools than hay cutting Mm -hmm. and uh, was less dependent on the long warm weather for drying so if you've never dried hay you cut the grass and then you need to like spread it out it takes a long time to dry yeah you can't have rain because then you just got to start it over again yes tree hay doesn't really require that the the methods that these different farmers used were probably mostly the same but we don't know that because nobody wrote it down It was all passed down generation to generation. And once two generations after it stopped being done, it was lost. There's a handful of people out there. I think the most recent data says that there are less than 10 active farms that do tree hay left in Norway, which seems like a problem. Sounds like a dying art form. Yes. And, And you know, I think about these things and it's not that it's a we need this information now. It's that we need the information. We might need the information in the future. I wouldn't even say that we don't need it now. I think we do need it now, and that's why we're in such a mess. Right. I get what you're saying, but... I'm trying to say information like this strictly because it isn't written down and because it's not archived. We can't go on Google, and like you were saying, we can't look this up and have it readily available. That's what makes it super important, and that's why I'm glad we're talking about it in this episode today, to get people interested so that they know... That it does exist, and maybe we can, you know, rekindle some of this information that could be lost to time. Yeah, and this is something I'm doing right now on my property. My trees aren't big enough to be harvested, but it is something I'm working on. And there's a bunch of people that are doing this kind of stuff, and we're all trying to figure it out for the first time in, in a lot of cases, a hundred years. All right. So, do you want to get into it and talk about um, the hands-on approach to how they were doing all this? I uh, a little bit. The actual hands-on process. There's a couple different ways that they would cut that tree hay, and it depended on the species and a couple other things. The location, so like I said, there's there's like the managed forest, the wild forest, the fruit trees, the orchard area. How they would handle each of these areas was a little bit different based on how far apart the trees were, the species, and so on. The term that they would use for collecting the tree hay is called lopping or lobbing. That's either done from a pollard, which is a tree that's been cut at like a specific height for whatever reason it might be to they cut it at a height that's above where their animals could graze so the animals wouldn't be picking the new buds which are the most delicious right off the trees and then causing the tree to not grow more leaves for a while because it has to recover so like if we when we talked about like pasture we had talked about you don't want the animals to graze too low and if they do the amount of growth that'll happen will significantly shrink because the, the grass has to do more work to be able to grow new growth The same thing with trees. If they eat the bud too early and the branch hasn't fully formed, then the the tree is going to spend a ton of time trying to build up that new branch as opposed to if you just cut it after the branch is done growing. So a lot of times they'll pollard the tree, which means cut it at like five or six feet, depending again on whatever species you're grazing and if they're utilizing the grass below. No, please notice the strict ecological approach to how this technique has come (laughs) come about. Absolutely. That's 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 one thing that we're trying to point out in this whole thing. But yeah, it's about somebody me. somebody saw and observed all of this and realized rather than having the plant spend the energy to grow new branches in order to do what it's going to do anyway, just do it after and it saves the energy and puts it back into what the fucking animals. Yeah, like it's a maximum utilization of resources as efficient as possible. So strictly the beginning of agriculture, but with a gatherer mentality. One of the things that's really unique, and we're going to talk about a little bit further, is how they had been doing this for so long that the evolution of the animals in the regions changed or or met. They aligned with the the interests of humans managing their landscape this way. But we'll we'll talk about that in a, a few. But another term you'll probably hear when it comes to tree hay is this uh, is shredding. The only difference between shredding and pollarding is that pollarding cuts the tree back to the same spot on the trunk, while uh, shredding is the term used to cut 
just the side branches, which allows for the trees to get taller. So if you need them for lumber, like straight uh, masts or whatever it might be, you know, for your house or a boat or whatever, you still have that one main trunk running up that eventually you can cut down. It also allows for more sunlight to get into the pasture for the grass to continue to grow. Again, this is an area that is colder, so your grass season is pretty short. So you want to maximize the sunlight access to it Mm -hmm. versus someplace like, say, Georgia, where you want to minimize how much sunlight is getting to that grass. I have a question for my own personal knowledge here, and I hope I don't make anybody confused. Go for it. What is the difference between pollarding and coppicing? So pollarding is, like I said, cutting at like that six foot level or whatever it might be. Coppicing is cutting it at the base. So you cut it like just like you were cutting down a tree. So coppicing is when you cut, like you stump it and it grows back from there. Yep. And then pollarding would be like you cut it. So at, like at the height where yeah. you want it to continue to grow at. Yeah. So like if you'll see like uh, what's called a, a coppicing stool, which is where some place has been repeatedly coppiced sometimes for thousands of years. Mm-hmm. And you'll see these things that look like these weird clusters of like little stubs that are like three inches out of the ground, but it's like five feet wide. Mm-hmm. And that's like something that's been alive for like, it's the same root ball it's that's been alive trunk. for like- It's a yeah. massive trunk that keeps trying to regrow. Yeah, and the, the roots are so big that they just shoot up like wild. You A lot of times you'll see, especially in Europe, pollarding was done for like decoration, especially in urban areas. Mm-hmm. And it'll look like a stump. And then you it'll almost look like a knuckle coming out of it, like three or four or five knuckles coming right out of the, the trunk that are like all burly and nasty looking. Oh, I'm going to have to look that up. That sounds cool as shit. I don't know what any of this looks like. Yeah. So it's cool stuff. The When the branches were cut, their leaves were still on, usually in the middle of summer or later summer, and they were gathered into bundles. So and, we're back to shredding now. Yeah. Sorry. Or it could be uh, shredding or pollarding. Either way, when they cut the branches, they do it in usually the summer or late summer. Obviously, the leaves are still on the trees, and they were gathered into bundles and dried by putting them in the pollards so that they would actually use the tree itself to hold the branches for them to dry out or cure or whatever term you want to use. Or they would do them in like like how they do with hay. You can like TP the hay, mm-hmm. make these little things to help them dry, like tripods almost. Mm-hmm. So airflow, um, they're drying out. Yeah. And like the, the, the nice thing about the pollards is you already know it's above grazing height. So you can put them up there and you don't have to worry about if the animal gets out of wherever you're keeping them, they can uh, still be protected. So the branches would be dried for about 14 days in this kind of process. And then um, if if it was going to be rainy, they'd be brought inside or they'd be put in a barn. Ultimately, the bar- they were all put in barns for storage or some kind of uh, protected shelter. Sometimes they're even broken down further into smaller like little clusters that could be fed individually depending on um, the needs. Sometimes they would also be further stored and they would actually strip the leaves off of the branches and thrown in sacks, kind of like feed. So they would, you'd have like these literal sacks of leaves that would be fed to the animals that had been dried and stored the right way so that they didn't lose any of their nutrient content. Cool. I break leaves into bags every fall and I fucking hate it. This sounds way cooler. I, I need to get some animals to eat yeah. them is what you're telling me. Yeah, my sheep love I need some piggy oak. banks. Yeah. I need some piggy banks. There you go. Get them piggies. So the trees they used for fodder were primarily ash, elm, birch, and willow. And the trees were generally about 15 years old when they started the pollarding process. Uh, They'd be cut in July and August and were cut again five to seven years later once they had a chance to regrow. And the trees were cut hard to stimulate buds near the top of the stubs. And the trees developed a candelabra shape with like... They grow like kind of tall and pretty thin and kind of, again, have that traditional tree shape where mm. it kind of like come up to a point at the top. Yep. You put a nice star up there or whatever yeah. the fuck you want with your pagan holidays. So in the winter, trees that were felled for firewood were stripped of twigs and bark, primarily elm and ash, and used as additional supplemental feed. Again, nothing went to waste. Uh, the practice of peeling the bark was called scav. And the bark was then cut into small pieces, mixed with warm or cold water, and fed to cattle in the winter and spring. And the rest of the wood was used as fuel. Yeah, the scav was primarily like a last-ditch effort when they are running out of other stuff to feed the animals. And even humans ate a version of this. They which call it gruel. <laughs> it's pretty it much gruel. Yeah, it's, it's like just pulp 
yeah. pulp food and like some liquid to get get it inside you yeah, without making it taste like sawdust. It's the we don't want to die yet food. Yep. Although supposedly there are some versions that are not too bad, but uh, I'm not planning on trying. Well, actually, I wasn't, would actually kind of want to try it. So correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't there like some Viking drink that was similar to Scav where it was fermented? Probably. Like fruit water or whatever that they would feed to animals and the sugars would do their thing and they would drink it. Yeah, probably. I, pretty, I mean, it would probably, I would not be surprised. They I, made alcohol out of everything. I don't think I'm making that up. I'm pretty sure I heard that somewhere. Yeah, so if you do, I'll cut it, it out. Quote so. me on it. <laughs> um, I'm a historian. So the other thing that's really interesting, and this is um, something I learned from, there's a YouTuber that's from Norway and they do traditional practices. But one of the things that, like we talked about, they strip the tri- the twigs and bark. They would actually strip the twigs and bark of a tree before it was dead the year before. And because of that, it would lose all of its sap, which would make the wood super hard before they even cut it down, which was super cool. That sounds awesome. So they made their own hardwood. Yeah, they would essentially dry the tree while it was still standing and alive. So they didn't have to deal with cutting it sap or whatever mess to be ready to roll when they cut it down. Great firewood. So there are a few reasons why this tree integration was so imperative for these Norwegian farmers. And we kind of covered a little, a little bit, of bit of this. Like we said, the summer season is short and the weather changes quickly. They um, utilized the trees and meadows to reduce the radiation and evaporation under the tree canopy so the soil stays moist. Again, because they're so far north, during the summer, the days are extremely long. So they want to, while still get uh, the sun to the, the grass and try to keep everything warm, there's also a lot of radiation coming through. So this was one way to kind of keep things in check. And I would assume with the dry climate that they have, they don't really have a whole lot of precipitation up there. So any water that's in the soil would need to stay there in order for the grass to do well, right? Yeah. And I'm not sure about that. But what I do know is that we're talking about around the ocean where pretty much everyone lived. It was mostly mountainous climate. So water runs downhill and doesn't tend to sit around. So when you do get it, it's not like it sticks. Right. You know, it'll it hit the ground. Stay around long. Yeah. So because they're on this slope, these well-developed tree root systems would bind the sand and gravel and prevent erosion to keep nutrients on the land, especially when you're grazing, the animals leave their droppings, and that was fertilizer. There was no alternative. Mm-hmm. So you didn't want that to run off completely from the landscape. This is something that kept the topsoil loss to a minimum. So I talked a little bit about the fact that they do harvest some hay. Traditionally, in these farms, the meadows were grazed for a short period from May to early June, and this prevented certain species from dominating the the grass uh, landscape. They then left this landscape for a few months or so, and that's when they would cut their hay, usually around middle to late July. This would be done because then they could store it for winter, and during this time is when they would start grazing the species further and further away where they could leave it alone again uh, after they would take this hay right before winter would begin they would come and graze one more time the cutting of these trees that they were pollarding and coppicing and uh, shredding coupled with these different management techniques of the land around them resulted in three main types of human induced vegetations although these categories do in some extent blend together or one thing that was interesting is that they did pollard all three of these. The first is the pollard woodland, which was generally not grazed because it would be dense land. One of the things that you might know about trees that are grown close together is they tend to grow straight up. So it was an easy way to pollard trees and get nice and long branches, especially if you needed wood. So the a pollarded woodland would be one place where you could grow a very specific type of tree where you could use the branches for specific things. The second was the wooded pastures, which were grazed. The trees were usually a little bit more spread out so the sunlight could hit the ground. And the third one was the wooded meadows, which is where they usually would get the hay from. The pollard woodland was usually lopped in the summer or autumn and shredded in the winter spring, about every five to seven years. So one of the things to know about pollarding and coppicing is it usually isn't something you do every year. It's usually something you do every five to 15, sometimes 20 years, depending on the cycle and the, I guess, the ecology. In general, in this area, they were doing it every five to seven years. And what that would mean is you would have different fields, essentially, where you would say, this, these three rows I'm going to cut this year, 
those three rows, I'll cut this next year and so on and so forth. And then you would just go through that cycle every seven years. So every year you were collecting, you just weren't collecting from the same trees. So again, that speaks to um, how this was passed down. Yeah, you had to know. Verbally through generations, you'd have to go through this. You know, you'd have to live, you would have to live through this, like a lived experience and go through seven years of pollarding, you know, through the cycle, whatever it is. It was a lifetime apprenticeship until Mm -hmm. the person that did it before you died or was too old to do it. Right. What I also think is interesting is you have these three different ecologies you could call them it was collectively no one really owned it but it was collectively understood you know who managed what Mm -hmm. um which is really interesting in terms of like uh there's no there there doesn't seem to be any evidence of it becoming a problem of who claimed which trees or anything like that right it seemed like all three of them existed at at the same time and there wasn't well i mean like the the uh, farms like there's no competing farms for similar landscapes being like those are my pollarded trees or right. something like that so yeah they would have these groves essentially where all the trees were cut at several different heights to maximize the amount of branches that would come out and also maximize the amount of sunlight that could get to the lower branches which obviously are a little bit easier to trim so the more sunlight you can get to the lower half of the tree the easier it is for you as the person collecting the tree hay another thing that they would do on top of this is also target various buds so i talked about you wanted to pollard above where the the animals could get to they would however cut some of the sappy new buds before there was any leaves because it was something the animals would eat and usually this is like the very end of your winter feed so you are it's either this or bark to feed your animals and you wanted to give them the best possible food obviously so they would uh, allocate certain parts of the tree that for whatever reason they maybe didn't want to harvest so like again you wanted to primarily harvest the lower half of the tree you might cut the the buds in the early spring at the top so that more sunlight throughout the year can get to the bottom you do that early trim you can feed them to your animals and then you it'll take the tree almost the rest of the year to uh recover that damage and again speaks to that candelabra shape so it it all makes sense when you think about it so the graced wooded pastures were primarily birches that were grown on the outskirts of the farms The one thing about birches is they can handle a lot of, they don't need very good soil to grow. So they're a good species for that area. Additionally, they tend to grow pretty quickly. So there's a couple benefits. These trees, like I said, they grow quickly. They can help bind the soil with their roots and stop that erosion. But what ends up happening because of these tree systems is that the appearance of the the, uh, woods and the kind of early stage woods, the gray area between orchard and woodlands becomes kind of park-like you've got these scattered trees with grazable grass below which kind of sounds a lot like again some of the thing we've talked about on the prologues is like when the colonists showed up to the new world they described it as looking kind of park-like because it was managed in a similar way even if they didn't have that livestock component these birch groves if you know anything about birches they're super uh coppiceable if you cut one down, about 35 new shoots come up right away. So they can be pretty aggressive with cutting them down and pollarding and things like that. One of the things that is unique about birches is that you, you can't pollard them down completely. They need to have some branches or they just won't really take off. So that is one thing that they did uh, traditionally do is plan to trim the tree down specific ways to maximize production. The last thing is the wooded meadows which were mostly meadows with a couple of pollards scattered about. So they would essentially be a meadow with like some random trees. Mm -hmm. These trees were usually cut back fully. So either down to like one stump of a pollard or a full coppice to exploit the ground and the trees to the full sunlight. The tree layer would usually be birch, ash, and maybe elm. And the ground floor tended to be a mix of species because of the diversity of sun and shade and the change of it. A lot of seeds sitting in the the ground seed bank would come up as those trees would get cut down or whatever it might be. So it allowed for a lot of diversity within the landscape. So what's really particularly amazing about these various systems, at least to me, is that the research has shown that because of these pollarding cycles and the savanna type habitat that exists in this space, where there's such an extensive variety in these types of forests, there was seven times more diversity and these human-managed forests utilizing pollarding, grazing, and this ancient knowledge 
which not only benefited the farmer and the animals that they grazed, but also nature. When we think about these complex systems, the goal is to create complexity that reinforces positive functions. And those relationships take a millennia to form, which raises the question that I brought up before, which is how long have these practices really been going on? While we have documentation of at least 10,000 years in this region, and that's pretty much because of the Ice Age, like when they were able to get up there, the question really remains is where did that come from? Was it learned before they went there? And if so, how long has this practice been going on? Well, I think it speaks to what we had mentioned earlier, saying that they had been doing this type of using this type of these type of methods to create their fodder long enough to where the animals um, evolved to accept this type of feeding. Yeah. So that means that must have meant that they were doing it for you know long enough to have that genetic mutation or you know genetic advantage take effect. Yeah, I think most animals will eat whatever they can get their hands on. That's green if they're a forager, and I'm sure just like watching. You think about like where the species that we have domesticated came from, you know, they the ones that they were primarily grazing, sheep and goats. Sheep, if you see wild sheep, they'll eat anything, and goats will obviously like literally eat literally anything. So my guess is that they knew what they would eat, and then it's a matter of domesticating them. But yeah, it's either way, it's still wild how we are able to. And I the point I really want to make is that they were able to see what worked to make humans survive this landscape. And not only did it make humans survive, but humans had such a massively positive impact on the landscape, uh, which I think, again, we always, I feel like we talk about like you go in nature, you do no harm. Like you don't want to leave it worse than when you left. Why aren't we making it better than when we left or when we showed up? Well, that's, and that's like the, to me, the point of humanity And the point of eco-anarchy or communalism or whatever is that we have the possibility of being a massive positive force on the environment around us. And this is a really good example of that. I agree with that, but I'm also interested in this because I'm coming at this from the other side. It's because I wanted to see where there might be possible solutions, but also I wanted to come at it logically and understand that, you know, we have the best intentions, but... I don't think people are smarter than nature. So, no, I don't think we're smarter than nature. I think that we are a component of nature. And like any other species in nature, no one is going to say that any particular animal is bad for the landscape yeah. and a, a landscape that they evolved with, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Humanity is a part of that landscape. So, why are we not a beneficial part of that landscape? Correct. Uh, and Correct. I think this, this points to that, that we can be. And the point is to think about what these people were doing and what about it was so good for the landscape that they could increase the diversity of a a landscape by seven times. Yeah. That's insane. Like we talk about this idea of like complex systems, like think about how much more complex humanity has made that landscape by its management. Mm -hmm. It's wild. It is. This is all cool and interesting, but I do want to talk about some examples of, farms that exist today that we can look at some of these practices being done in real time. And again, a lot of this has been lost, but we do have people actively trying to save and salvage these practices. A good example of a historical farm is one that I cannot pronounce on the island of Osteroy, which I probably also am pronouncing incorrectly, northeast of Bergen and at an altitude of 60 meters on the edge of a fort. Fjord, Ford, fjord. Ford, 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 fjord, fjord, and on the edge of a fjord, the farm is called Havratunit, is my guess. Havratunit. One of the things to keep in mind when we talk about these farms is that the Norwegian farms are traditionally small groups of families living in small settlements or what they call cluster farms. This farm is a cluster farm that is also a living museum and gives a good idea of what the farming in Norway was like traditionally. Today, it is funded by the government mostly, which keeps it as an, essentially an uh, opportunity to save some of this knowledge before it's lost. That's um, cool as shit. It's yeah. a fucking museum, but it's also fully functional as yeah, the, the old ways. Yeah, it's like Plymouth Plantation, but not as stupid. Yeah, that's garbage. Yeah. This cluster farm that it, they still have still has 60 people living in it. This cluster farm of, I'm not even going to pronounce it. How it. Yeah. 
This cluster farm had 60 people living in it in 1900. It was managed in a traditional way until 1960, but around that time, the areas near the farm buildings were still managed, while the outer fields, those uh, meadows and things like that, had been neglected. Today, there are four farms there, and the people who live there do so because they like the ideology of living in the traditional way. Those are some hardcore motherfuckers, dude. Yeah. These... The traditional Scandinavian farm, like I said, I hinted at before, kind of has this infield where co- crops are grown, the annual crops, and I was close to the buildings as well as that outfield where they would do those summer grazing, cutting of hay, pollarding, all of that kind of stuff. At this farm, there's a one acre plot of land where they grow corn and potatoes, which are obviously, at least the corn is not native, but they still do it. Mostly the people worked on their own plots, but for the physically hard work, they generally helped each other in a collectivist sense. The other land that we kind of talked about was pretty much communal. People would access it as they needed and understand that it was collectively owned so they wouldn't destroy it. And there's no records of it ever being destroyed. So suck on that fucking capitalist. (laughs) So the people from this communal farm used to help the people living on the other side of the fjord at certain times of years for things like haymaking when you had to do it all in a very short window of time. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of work to be done. These, you know, manual labor that needed to be done. They didn't have machines for this. Yeah. So, and like we said, because of the short climate and the fact they wanted to maximize their production, a lot of times they had multiple small houses. And for these people, the Havranet, Havratunet, Havratunet, Havratunet was worked first because it was the south-facing side of the the mountain, and the grasses would be harvested sooner, and the other farm that was that they had would be harvested second, because it was north-facing, so that two- or three-week difference allowed them to harvest one field of hay, go to the next, harvest the next field of hay. So you're telling me if one's south-facing and one's north-facing, and say there's a giant hill-slash-mountain in between these, they're doing half-day walks and stuff to get to the other side? They weren't. They would do it, like, throughout the year. Throughout so they're, the year. They were almost, like, semi-nomadic. Right. So they're, they're chasing the sun, basically. Kind for, of, for yeah. For lack of a better word. They're chasing the sun while also integrating that hunter-gatherer lifestyle where they would fish when they couldn't do the other things. The summers, they would traditionally actually have less work to do because of the fact that the days were longer, the animals were grazing themselves, they weren't feeding them. So that's when they would fish and build up the stores for the other stuff that they weren't going to harvest. They had yeah. To, and that's crazy. So they had their lifestyle was designed around the ecology and what the ecology provided, which is like, makes I, fucking I, sense. I, I feel like that's what life is supposed to be like. Yes, that's 100%. You're not supposed to work 40 hours in a fucking Cube. cubicle. And check your email seven times a day and then go get fast food or whatever the fuck. Yeah, and that's like, like right now it's February 13th that we're recording. And in like two or three weeks, I'm going to be tapping maple trees. And that's like the first sign of spring. And that's how once I know it's time to start tapping maple trees, I'm like, it's spring. We made it because that's how I know we're on the way out. There's something really comforting about having that relationship and something to look forward to a little bit every year throughout the cycle that also is good for you. Like you telling me I don't need hockey to fucking look forward to something to the winter? I can be you go, tapping maple trees and shit? Go deer hunting and uh, tap a maple tree in the spring. Can I find a way in life to do all of those things? Yes, you just I don't. I want to play hockey and also You do, can do all of those things. You just got to work a job. I need a new twig. It's a hockey stick. Oh, Sorry. I don't know those things. So there's another project going on called the Grinde Farms, which is particularly interesting because... They've been trying to learn some data about how this farm works compared to modern agriculture. The farm has been operating since the Bronze Age, and speaking to the length of time these traditional farming practices have been in place, and for example, in their pollarding practices of primarily elm and ash, they produce roughly 850 pounds of fodder for animal consumption on an acre, which is significantly less than the average hay field, which produces closer to 4,000 pounds of hay but the land actually showed that the hay production under the trees was around 5,195 pounds. While that 850 pounds of fodder is cycled every five years, meaning you would average about 210 pounds a year, these organic, unsprayed pastures produce roughly 5,400 pounds of fodder, or about 1,400 pounds more per acre than conventional farming, 
while using zero machinery. So one thing I do want to mention real quick, just cut you off about that, which is I think interesting is that it might seem insane that you could produce more. But if we think about that, the soils episode or the pasture episode, where we were talking about the differences between C3 and C4 grasses, Mm -hmm. the uh, cool climate and the warm climate grasses, you usually have the cool climate grow quickly in the spring and then they kind of slow down in the summer. The summer grasses take off in the summer. But what actually usually happens is those grasses aren't super efficient in direct sunlight. They actually grow more efficiently in, the shade. in some dappled sunlight, especially in the warm summer weather. So trees can not only grow themselves, but they can provide that shade so that the grass grows even faster. So you're getting the best of both worlds, which is why, as we'll talk in the agricultural component of the show, silvo pasture offers a lot of benefits, and we're seeing them right here. It's using nature. Yeah, it's using to, that to stacking its, function. Yeah. Yep, but to its maximum benefit, which is really cool. So the average farm holding in Western Norway had 6 to 10 cattle and calves. Until recently, the small native breed Vestland Skier, 25 to 30 sheep or goats, and a horse or two. So again, that's 6 to 10 cattle or calves, 25 to 30 sheep or goats, and a horse or two. It took between 2,500 and 3,000 bundles of leaves to keep them fed through the winter. And a good family team could cut, make, and hang 50 or 60 bundles a day, taking 15 or 20 bundles from each tree. So what's that come out to? Like, how much time does it take to cut all that hay? 3,000 bundles, and you you do about max 60 per day. About 50 days. That's two months right there. Yeah. Yeah, You're looking at almost two months of work right there. So that's pretty much the summer. Yeah, it's like late summer. Late summer. That's your uh, July, August. Yep. And so they, they took the ash first, and then the elm, and then the other trees. And then the daily yield was about 100 pounds of ash or 200 pounds of elm. And it took almost two months to harvest. So that would be the July or August for them to harvest all of the leaf hay. And again, they were drying it for 14 days and then um, storing it in the barns, keeping it covered so that it could last through the winter. Yeah, so before the land reforms of the 19th century, as um, political climate changed in Norway, most farms had a clustered dwelling place, like I said, where seven or eight extended families might live together in this little cluster, hamlet, whatever you want to call it. It was essentially a small town of some kind, very small town. All had holdings on the named farm. In the old days, the nearby fields were divided into strips and shared out or traded among the group members. Each was considered a private holding, some for crops and gardens, some were for grazing cattle, sheep and goats, some were for hay and some woodlands, which were almost always pollarded. The subdivision of these farms ended up creating these really tightly packed communities of peasants, all roughly equal in social and economic status. Farmers followed the green as it spread up the hillsides in the spring. Again, that idea of following the ecology, going up the mountain where it is colder and the sun would get there, uh, warm it up later, they would follow that with their animals and then follow it back down in the autumn. Because again, those warmer climates would stay a little bit warmer a little bit later. Each farmer had at least two farms, and many had three or four a main farm, a spring farm, a summer farm, and sometimes even an autumn farm. So essentially, how it was designed was again kind of going up and down those mountains. The spring farm was generally the way station, often on a plateau just a little way up the valley, a few hundred feet higher than the spring, the general home, the, the year round, whatever, the main home. I guess you could call it. The farmer looked for a place that had good grazing and where at least one field might be mowed. So that would be where they would cut their hay. The cattle and the sheep would feed in the meadows through the late spring when that first burst of those C3 grasses would shoot up. They would also start to begin the process of pollarding. Again, whether it was cutting actual the leaves or if it was cutting the buds for the animals to eat before the grass was ready would depend on things like the sun the stone in the ground that would reflect and retain that thermal mass and the slope of the landscape. The spring farm was near enough home that you could come down in the evening carrying the day's milk with you. There it would be consumed or it would be stored in things like butter and cheese. After the animals had gone up to the summer farm, men from the main farm would hay the spring farm meadow, storing the fodder in one of their barns. In winter, they would come with the sleds to bring that hay back home. To bog in that shit. Hell yeah. Down hills and shit. Super Norway. Hell yeah. So the summer farm was a little bit different. 
It was usually half or more often a full day's walk from the main home. The people who kept it lived there for most of the summer, from 4 to 12 weeks, depending on the location and its microclimate. This is also usually where the women and children would live during the year. The women and girls milked the animals and made the butter and the cheese while the boys watched over the grazing herds. The summer season was a time of relaxation and rest. Before the end of the 19th century, there were roughly 70,000 summer farms still in operation in Norway. By early September, there might be fresh snow on the peaks. They would start to bring the animals down and often again to the farm that they had used in the spring or sometimes to a separate autumn farm for two or three weeks and then back to the main farm. Throughout this process, the animals would be grazing and again, sometimes depending where they were, they'd be collecting those hay bales that had been cut down or the tree the tree hay that had been harvested and bringing it back to their main farm. In many areas of Norway, this farming was characterized by an extensive use of land held in common, partly in the shape of common ownership and partly in the form of an intricate division of territory, which gave each farmer a large number of widely scattered strips and plots. The smallest in size and largest in number of such holdings were to be found in the coast and the fjord districts where the farms were extensively divided and where the areas of arable land were smallest in relation to the population. Common ownership like this fostered mutual dependence and demanded mutual adjustments between users of the same subdivided farm. Social relations of the same sort were also often prevalent between peasants on different farms which, because of natural circumstances or historical development, had certain interests in common. These interests might relate to the forests, the cuttings of the woodlands, to the pastures, fishing, uh, whether it's in the lakes or the sea, to sites for boathouses, to roads and things like bridges. The variety of work inherent in subsistence farming created a basis for extended mutual help between neighbors and the need for relatively large households attached to each individual farmer. All right, so let's break that up a little bit. So these relationships they're forming, um, you're saying the ownership of who lived in the houses was basically based on marriages between families and if it was convenient for bob to go take that abandoned house over there because bob knows how to because bob needs know. a fucking house yeah, and bob, that house is empty bob, yeah bob yeah. needs a house and bob needs corn to grow yeah uh it was an understanding that it's everybody knows everybody and nobody wants anybody to be homeless or to starve to death and as long as everyone was willing to do their part the idea was to utilize the available resources to meet the needs of the community Interesting. Were there other farms for these fuckers to go find if they didn't like their little hamlet village or whatever? There were multiple hamlet villages or whatever you want to call them. It was a matter of becoming a part of that community, how you did that, which uh, I did not research, so I can't really answer to. Well, I'm just thinking for all those naysayers out there who some say something like this wouldn't work. Yeah, um, I mean, it, Tell it's... Them to go find a new fucking village if you yeah. want, whatever. Go do your whatever the fuck you want to do in your own village and fuck off uh, was kind of the general idea. So the idea was that collectively they had this economic self-sufficiency. And while infrequent communications with the outside world helped to make these communities very tight knit, the community was still of utmost importance to all of the individuals who felt very much in power because it was a small community where I, again, that direct democracy continued to exist because everybody knew everybody and knew what was going on. So everything was so very near and also accessible if they ever needed to have any concerns about what they were doing. So back in the 1950s, Norway set out to record what remained of these ancient farming practices before they were lost, and studies were done to document their own history. Mr. Halvard Bjorkvik, historian and you like that spelling yeah, that pronunciation. Awesome. Halvard Bjorkvik, Bjorkvik, uh, historian and philologist, summarized the research and what I think is really uh, insightful. Here's the quote: Bjorkvik, Bjorkvik. Is it Bjork 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 Bjorkvik? B J. I think is B B Bjork. I also don't speak Swedish, so that's hard. That's a tough one. I'm going with Bjorkvik. I'm gonna have to look that up. So what he said was, uh, in quote, in order to make the basic points of the Institute's investigations more easily understood by non-Norwegian readers, 
I will end this introduction with a discussion of the meaning of the Norwegian word in conception, which in English is generally expressed by the word farm, and which I have occasionally expressed hitherto as subdivided farm. I might as well have called it complex of farms. The fact is that all these conceptions are expressed in the one Norwegian word, gard or yard. 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 Etymologically identical with the English yard in courtyard, churchyard, etc. Today, now that enclosure has taken place, this word conveys to most Norwegians a picture of one single peasant's dwelling and fields, such as it has apparently always done in most parts of Denmark and Sweden. In Norway, in the past, this conception of the word prevailed only in the eastern parts of the country, especially in the open lowlands in southeastern Norway and Trondelag, where the farms, even before the enclosure, formed individual units with houses and grounds fairly clearly separated from neighboring farms. In the mountain districts, however, and especially in the fjord and coastal parishes in the west and north of Norway, where the farms had been most extensively subdivided, and where space was scarce, the peasants from the same subdivided farm usually built their houses close together in a common ton, etymologically identical to town, and had a comprehensive and complex agrarian community. Here, the word guard continues to be used for the whole collection of lands and dwellings, which was covered by the same original place name. It was thus a unit of individual, but more or less mutually interdependent farms. In its questionnaires and instructions, the Institute uses the word guard in the sense of a subdivided or multiple farm. This is normal in many parts of the country and readily understood everywhere, even in the eastern districts where multiple farms are not by any means unknown and where people at least have a clear conception of the fact that a group of separate single farms can spring from one original farm, the name of which the secondary farms still carry. The individual peasants dwelling and land, in accordance with authorized Norwegian usage, are called brook or guardsbrook, meaning individual holding of a farm. No difficulty is caused by the fact that both guardsbrook and guard, according to meaning, are also used in connection with the numerous farms in all parts of the country, which still remain undivided and therefore constitute a single person's holding, apart from possible cottagers' allotments which were the property of the farmer and were never referred to as a guard. The Norwegian language lacks an indigenous word for the European conception of village or hamlet. The Swedish by, known in many town and village names in England, has this meaning, though with many local modifications, but in Norway it has for centuries only meant town. The Danish landsby, village, is used in Norwegian, but only about villages in other countries. Even as far back as our provincial laws of the Middle Ages, there is no evidence to be found of any planning of settlement and field system, and there is no parallel in Norway to the detailed regulations to be found in Danish and Swedish laws. End quote. So that was a lot, but I thought it was really, really interesting for a, a number of reasons. You want to break it down? Hell yeah. Let's break it down. So first off, the fact that the concept of community and farm and individual farm this really what it boils down to is this concept of ownership of the means to survive didn't really exist not in the way we think about it uh within norway right no not really because you had the opportunity to grow what you could by yourself if you wanted to but but it it's was usually it was clear it was clearly visible that you could stay at home and grow whatever and toil yourself and try to do for yourself. But if you worked with everybody else and pitched in, just like we were saying with compl- all complex systems, the sum of its parts is greater than, or sorry, the sum of the parts is greater than the individual parts themselves yeah. combined. Yeah, and they lacked the language to speak of this commodified version of the community that existed, these small, what we call hamlets, that they didn't really have a word for is just the way you lived is essentially what it came down to. It was like, it was like trying to provide a framework for something that has is so intrinsic that you can't 
You're like, what do you mean? Right, right. So basically, they're saying people are like, oh, what town or village do you live in? They're like, what do you mean? What else would we live in? Yeah. Kind of. Like, it's almost like when we were talking about um, how does humanity be a part of nature? Like, what is the word that means humanity as being part of nature? We almost can't even come up with that word because we have such a hard time understanding humanity and nature. I think nature. it's called animal. I hate you. Um, <laughs> no, like just the idea that we don't have the language to you articulate these certain terms. And sometimes it's hard to articulate something that should have a term to use as a metaphor in this case to say like, that's similar. They, it's so hard for us to wrap our head around. We don't give it a word mm -hmm. for them. For them, it was this, it was this concept of this is my community. And there really wasn't a word for my personal community as like a thing that exists. It was a, this is where you live. You live with other people. That's how life exists. Right. So it's the same concept of showing up in a new place and people live there. You don't speak the language. And you ask them who owns, you know, the land that we're now occupying. Like who owns the land that we're standing on? I'm talking about American colonizers. They got over here with the idea of ownership. And they asked them who owns this. We own this now. And they brought them deeds and things like that. And yeah, it took like, a while the for the indigenous people yeah. to understand the concept of what the fuck ownership means. It's like, how does that translate? It doesn't translate, right? Yeah, no, it doesn't. And the fact that they they realized that this word didn't exist, I think, speaks to how innate that concept of community and the the fluidness of ownership that existed when they were talking about these communities and who owns what farm and what what landscapes and things like that. It wasn't a um, a permanence to the ownership. It was based on the fluidity of the needs and the desires of the com the collective whole. What would benefit everybody? Everybody needs their separate ownership in terms of who is responsible for where they graze and things like that. But that isn't a final decision in the sense that you will own this until the day you die. It was these are your fields until otherwise. Yeah, that sounds pretty ballin' though. Also, if you have a summer house like up in the mountains where it's fucking nice all summer long and you just chill out and make butter and cheese, you know, that sounds cool as shit. Do you yeah. want to well, be Norwegian? One of the other things that they uh, talked about with the summer houses is that the workload was usually less and they had a lot of uh, leisure time. I'm sorry. We were talking about big shoulders. You know how big your shoulders would be after making butter all summer long with the fucking butter churn? I don't know if you've ever seen one of those fucking things. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Yeah. Well, think about how big your shoulders would be after making butter for three months up in the mountains, dude. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say. I made that joke at the beginning of this episode, and that's actually true now that I learned some shit. <laughs> they made butter, and that's why their shoulders are huge. They got yeah, the long stroke. They got those long strokes, dude. They're good swimmers. <laughs> it all makes sense. It's coming together, dude. We brought uh, that shit together, dude. Oh, uh, Yeah. So one of the things that I read and I wasn't planning on bringing up, but I think now that we're talking about it kind of makes a lot of sense, is that a lot of these farmers, why they didn't want to industrialize when things were progressing is because they had so much time off during the summer. Like they were notorious for having like the summer off to kind of enjoy life and spend time with their family. And generally, there were a lot of children being born in the, the early spring because of this. Because they had nothing else to do. Well, not nothing else to do, but they their life wasn't as hard as it might appear on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, Even though it looks like, like we said earlier, sparse conditions. Yeah. It was a way for them. They, they had a way that was ingrained into the conditions that they were living in that gave them a comfortable way of life where they didn't want to change it, basically. Yeah, they learned to live with the landscape and align their interests with the interests of the environment. Mm -hmm. They were... They provided something that made the environment better than it was without them. And the environment paid in dividends for that. Yeah, man. Sounds like you got to like a lot of salted fish and like pickled, be worse. pickled stuff and like smoked meats. If I can have a lot of fucking butter and time off, I'm happy. I'm not, I'm not picky. Big shouldered women, dude. They've been making butter, dude. <laughs> they're going to give you, they're going to butter you right up. Yeah. Woo. All right. So tell us about Kusalid. We're going deep. So these ancient farms could not have lasted a decade without their trees. Only about a tenth of the land in this country can grow crops or pasture. And no matter how carefully you harvested and stored, 
and from how many farms you cut grass hay, you could not cut enough to last the winter, and about one-sixth of the land was woods. Ash and elm were the most common trees near the fjords, and everywhere else it was the birches. And they harvested all of them. Pollarded, yeah. fucking shredded. We talked about the two other farms, uh, one that's still active and then one that there's some historical data on. There's a third farm, which is, I think, kind of what I actually tried really hard to get a hold of this dude to interview him. And I even reached out to the writer of the a paper that I'd read about him. And this guy does not exist on the earth, um, at least not on the internet part of the earth. It's a fucking pseudonym. Yeah, pseudonym. maybe. Um, so I've been looking up this project. It's called <clears throat> Kusalid for a while now. And it, it seems like the mix of what we're thinking about when we talk about utilizing the technology that we have for the future. And I think he's kind of living that dream right now. So this project called Kusalid paints a picture of what that future could look like. The farm has about 100 pollards right now and is one of three sites across the country that are currently cutting the trees for leaves, at least on uh, any sizable capacity. Kare, I believe is how you pronounce his name, Kare. Kare, the farmer, has developed a way of using the leaves as fodder, but has also adapted the traditional methods to suit modern farming. Cutting and making leaf bundles is time-consuming, and the bulky dried leaves need lots of space to store. Kare cuts the elm leaves and branches from the trees and shreds them through a shredding machine and keeps it spread out on a concrete apron of, of the barn and dries them. He has a hundred sheep and he feeds them the dried shredded leaf and wood chip mixture in the morning and silage in the evenings. The sheep live inside for five months over the winter and pick through the dried leaves not only provides food but it also keeps them entertained essentially busy during the long winter seasons when they're trapped inside or unable to eat much outdoors. The wood chips that the animals don't eat are usually used as bedding during the lambing season. Kare has also tried some experimental projects that have failed, including trying to make silage from the leaf wooden chips rather than drying them, but this didn't really work out because of the amount of wood content. If you're not familiar with silage, silage is hay that is essentially made anaerobic, like given anaerobic conditions that helps essentially pickle it is mm -hmm. the best way I guess yep. you could. It doesn't oxidize it. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, he tried doing this with his tree hay and it didn't work because there was too much wood matter in it and uh, i'm sure there's a very chemical explanation that i cannot explain so harvesting the leaves in this modern method was obviously quicker than the traditional way so we had talked about what those farms have to harvest in order to feed their i think it was about 12 animals the sheep and the cows and all that stuff they're able to harvest roughly 537 bundles of leaves in a day compared to what did we say 50 for a family 50 to 60 yeah so it's probably 10 to 100 times quicker, depending on how many kids you've got, than the traditional method. There's also the savings in transport, drying, and storage, which is estimated to be roughly 10 times more efficient. Despite the fact that the equipment costs money, it turns out that it's about equal in terms of cost-benefit. Uh, you're spending more money to have less labor time, which I'm. if somebody says they can pay $100 to have the same, to get that $100 back, but to have like a month off i will happily give somebody a hundred dollars to have that month off so i think that speaks to the fact that this is a way to think about how we could uh, integrate this type of lifestyle into modern agriculture so like i said we this has been going on for a while this this practice and like i said it's we knew it was at least four or five thousand years but recent research that came out in 2018 using pollen data points that it's actually significantly longer um there's Evidence of forest clearing, local burning, and soil changes that indicate grazing as early as 7,000 years ago and up to about 15,000 years ago, which again is when the Ice Age started to recede and this land became accessible for humans. Mm -hmm. That's crazy because I do pollen data every time I sprinkle that keef on my bowl, dude, take a huge hit, you know what I'm talking <laughs> about? You get that pollen. Never mind, go ahead. So- What's really cool about using pollen and charcoal record is that we can piece together the evolution of the farming practices that became indigenous to the region. Like I said, the, the records going back 10 to 15,000 years when the land first was opened up from its icy rest shows a quick succession of hazels and eventually birches, as well as first and shade-loving water-saturated understory plants. 
Human activity quickly stepped in and started to manage the forest, clearing much of the hazel and nearly all of the firs that stood dispersed here and there. Records show massive amounts of wood being cut and left to rot, as evidenced by the fungal record, as well as controlled burns, and as essentially there was an opening of the landscape. Massive increases in uh, dung and changes in the soil composition show the evidence of new animals being brought in and controlled. And this is where it really starts to get interesting, because they can use local sites to compare disturbed to undisturbed areas, which reinforces what was done by humans versus nature. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, it's amazing what they can do with that shit. They can tell just by the fungal records hanging around. Fungal, pollen, all that stuff comes and together. Charcoal, yeah. that's crazy. So overall, the pollen records suggest that the local environment was intensively disturbed, where the woodland surrounding it remained largely unaffected by the anthropogenic activities during this time. In this practice, we can see the long-standing history of the indigenous people being a functional part of the landscape. It wasn't something that was manipulated for singular use, but for the collective good of all nature. Unfortunately, a lot of this tradition, like I said, has been lost in the globalized world. But like our buddy Kare, there are folks looking to keep these traditions alive, and in doing so, we keep ourselves connected with our history and with our ecology. Fuck yeah. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. And chances are, for most folks, this is largely new information and hopefully a bit eye-opening. We will have the extensive list of papers in the podcast description, much of which are research essays, but it's also worth checking out William Bryant Logan's book, Sproutlands, which includes some deeper dives into the everyday lives of the folks in this region, among many, many more similar coppicing projects in history. And if you enjoyed this, again, please, if you use iTunes, give us a review. These reviews are crucial in our growth as we rank higher in searches, have better data to point to for more prospective guests, and allows us to continue to prove that what we are doing is valuable. We have continued to grow faster than we would have ever expected, and that's all to the work you folks do. And of course, if you want to hear us talk more about this stuff, because all of the content on this podcast isn't quite enough, go check us out on Patreon, where we have even more content. And again, if you enjoyed this, check out our Venmo and PayPal. Throw us a couple bucks if you don't want to sign up as a Patreon. It helps us pay for all the costs of keeping this stuff going and knowing you guys are appreciating it. Do you appreciate it, Elliot? I'm appreciating all of this. Awesome. This is so much fun. I have so much fun doing this. And we learned so much. I learned a lot today, actually. Today? Yeah, just today specifically. You didn't show up I knew anything. everything else that we've covered, everything I already knew it. Oh, yeah, I guess that. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, like, you didn't know any of this before today. No, that none was, of this. None of this. None of it. Cool. I never even heard of Norway. What is a Norway? I just, found, I just found out it was cold. You know it was cold in Norway? What's cold? Not warm. I don't understand those words. So we got to put it in context. Yeah. It's all re- relative right. for something. So anyways, this is Andy. This is Elliot. And this is the Poor Pro's Almond. Bye, guys. Bye.